Let's start with the famous infantry. So we have here six members of the Ermine Street Guard, all looking magnificent in their Lorica Segmentata. I believe this is Corbridge pattern, is that right? Yes. So this is a Corbridge pattern, and uh, I notice that there's a, there's a little gap just there in, in, a, in a lot of these Corbridge patterns. It, is that, you know, are you just showing off? Are you Are just tempting the enemy? Go on then, see if you can get that little weak spot if you're hard enough. Well, just manly. Okay. <laughs> it's the way they were reconstructed in 1964 when they first discovered the fragments. Um, they right. were studied by A. Russell Robinson in the Tower of London. Mm -hmm. He um, worked out exactly how they fitted together and his interpretation was that it was there was an overlap um, at the front and that's why there's a little gap at the top that they're not an exact fit. Uh, later models were more exact than this. All right, and I see that you're, you're wearing these so-called groin protectors. Um, do, do they actually work, do you think? Because I have to, when I, when I see these, I think to myself, that's not really going to pr pr protect the crown jewels terribly well. No, no. no. <laughs> mainly decorative, but it does keep the tuning very neat at the front, and it doesn't sort of fly up in the air when you run, so it's so de mainly yes. decorative. To be honest, they're a damn nuisance when you're running as well. They really do catch mm. it. Right. So they, they could they could even um, uh, sort of flop in, uh, just at the wrong moment and, and totally hurt you a bit. Yes, quite easily. Oh dear. Okay, so we think decorative and keeps the tunic looking nice, but uh, as, as a piece of armour, a um, bit of a waste of uh, metal. No, it's more it's more uh, bling more than more than anything. It's more like a, an ego thing. Right, but you think they would have been worn in battle? Oh yes, yes. It's a sign of the legionary. Right. It shows you that you were in the military, the, the belt and the, the apron in front. And I see that uh, you're all wearing your uh, gladi on your right hand side and the straps go underneath the, your belts going around so that uh, when you pull out your sword uh, you don't just get the scabbard following it. Um, does any of you actually own your own kit or is this all loaned by the organisation? We have to maintain our own kit. We, we get issued kit when we join the guard. Right. And then uh, you have to maintain your own kit as part of being in the Ermine Street Guard. I see over here, this man here, some interesting armour on his right arm. Uh, so have you, have you recently returned from Dacia? No, no, I haven't, no. But uh, you, you're wearing the, the, the Dacian fashion, I believe, that we know from Trajan's Column. Yeah, this was discovered in Carlisle, or some like it was discovered in Carlisle, which dates from 80 to 120 AD. So that so might actually be before be the Dacian before campaign. Dacian campaign, yeah, possibly. Right. So it could be that this was a commoner sort of armour than we realise. Yes, yeah, possibly. And they never find them in pairs, then. They only ever find just no, one. Only singles, yeah. Okay. So we can be reasonably sure that they're for use uh, by a man who's got a large shield to protect his other arm. Precisely. Now. That looks pretty. That looks pretty wicked. I don't know if it's razor sharp, but you wouldn't have to be very sharp to be pretty dangerous if you actually threw that thing. No, no, no. It, it does. It would. If we did throw this, it would, uh, it would definitely penetrate through flesh and and wood of shields as well. So you're you're wandering around in public carrying a lethal weapon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So how bendy do you think that shaft would have been? Because I, I've heard some people say that they were deliberately very soft and other people say, no, that's nonsense. They were just stiff as, uh, as iron as they could manage. No, well, they did vary. There were different methods. Some of the ones with the riveted tang here, mm -hmm. one of the rivets would be replaced by a wooden peg, so that would break. And all of the iron shank would be hardened, so it would be hard iron. But a lot of them would have been heat treated in the forge so that they were relatively soft. Right. So they were likely to bend after impact, mm -hmm. and it would be difficult to return them. And also, if they stuck in someone's shield, it would be disable the shield straight yeah. away. And, uh, or could they get out? Yes. Now, I know that uh, some people reconstruct uh, soldiers of this period with two peeler, and all of you are carrying one. On the march, you would carry two. We have found that uh, in practice that when we give them the first one, it's not usually very powerful because you're holding another one and your shield. But then we find that when we throw the second one, it has a lot more power and accuracy. So, um, I don't know, maybe maybe through living history we have proven that um, two-peeler does work. I see you're all wearing quite uh, hefty neckerchiefs. I imagine that the uh, that's for comfort as much as anything because the, the edge of your... Lorica must dig in a bit. It does prote protect you from chafing from the 
the armour. And I see you have some beautiful, beautiful sort of cutaway design on the top of your scabbard there. Mm. That's certainly a bit of a bit of bling. So why would that be there? Would that be there because you, the, the individual Roman soldier, had paid extra for it to be done? Or do you think you just got really lucky with what you got issued? No, that would be exactly bling. And uh, basically, if you go to the coinage, you would actually have a bling up your own equipment. All oh, right. That's a definite. <laughs> so that would be, that would be what the, the Roman call, uh, the, what the modern soldiers would call, oh, Gucci scabbard. It certainly is. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, that, you've, you've heard the cornerson. You must go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here we have a chap carrying some Lorica Segmentata and he's pointed out some interesting details on the inside of it. And let's start with this interesting bit of leather on the inside. Can you tell me about that? That's to keep it off your shoulders, that. Mm -hmm. And we found out because the rivets on the inside were longer in certain places. So then we adapted it so we could put the leather on it and it, it makes sense. And when we're marching, the metal isn't on your shoulders anymore. Right. So that makes it substantially more comfortable. It does, yes. Right. And I can see that this uh, bottom bit here, it, concertinas, it, very easily, that's quite supple leather yes, there. Yes, it is, yeah. Uh, but there's, there's not a huge amount to uh, protect you from this lower rim, just the very edge has been bent round a bent, bit, yeah. so it's a little bit broader. This is made to measure to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the sections are, the top sections especially, so it fit on my shoulders and everything. You couldn't start to go onto a different battlefield and pinch pieces off, and if you had a blacksmith, he could sort of alter it for you, and right. then, then you could be able to do that. But the majority of the soldiers would be wearing um, chain. Mm -hmm. So one chain would fit everybody. Right, but you, you think that this design, Lorica, then, uh, really isn't very uh, standardised? You couldn't just have small, medium and large? No. You'd have to have them fit to you personally. Or you'd end up with uh, sore back, sore shoulders, and hips would be all ragged. Roman authentic bread. Flattish in eight pieces. And do you have to wear some leather or padded this. garment underneath it? Yeah, that's what I'm wearing now. Mm -hmm. So without that, it would just chafe its way through a tunic pretty quickly? Oh yes, it? it would, yes, yeah. Sometimes they would add a, a more padded uh, tunic than I'm actually wearing at the moment. Standard message tablet. Cheaper than paper, you write on one side in ink, score it down the middle, fold and seal. About as much writing as a postcard. Yes. Got something in there. It's actually an apple crumble, Roman apple crumble. Roman apple crumble? Yeah. Mix the right metals and you get something called mirror bronze. It's an alloy of copper, but it looks like silver. And as you can see here, makes a mirror that really works. Very pretty. May I ask you, sir, about your short sword, which is, as far as I can tell, very far from short. Yeah, Gladius. Mm -hmm. Standard side arm. This one is a mains. It was found in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, different to the parallel sided Pompeii design. Yep. This is more of a heavier hitting, longer point, designed for splitting chainmail. Do, do we know that it's for splitting chainmail or is that uh, It just works. Speculated? We've actually right. tested it uh -huh. and it does work to that. The Pompeii one. Uh, Optio. Can I borrow your blade a minute? Parallel sided. Ah, the Pompeii style. Right, yeah, yes. more of a stubbier end. This mm -hmm. is more for going into squishy bits of people. Right. So you've you've tested the that Gladius or one like it. One like it. On authentic Roman mail that was yep. properly uh, riveted and so forth. Yes. And with a bit of oomph, you can get it through. Yeah, it takes a bit of welly, but it will go. Because remember, you only ever need that much of a blade to put somebody down. Mm -hmm. There's none of this like Hollywood waving it around your head. It was a short stab from here, putting as much force forward as you can yeah. into the lower part of the body there. So do you know how, how long that sword is? Going by Roman measurements. 18. This one is approximately 20 inches. I know that because the little finger to there, to my thumb, is nine inches. And that's a measurement that was used in the catapults for the three-span bolt. That's why it's called a three-span, there to there. So how many people are you cooking for today? Eight of us. All right, so it's like one Roman section. Yes. So each man gets one-eighth of that stotty cake. Yeah, some of this. 
They've got some cheese ready for them as well. They've got grapes, apples. Oh, you're set up. Oh, ah, yeah. We don't starve here. Centurion, transverse crest. Optio, the chosen man, the man for whom we have opted. Ventral crest. The original of it was worn away completely on this side and that side. And when I wear the scale armour, it doesn't really do much to it. If I wear it with that kind of armour, the Lorica Segmentata, it just chews through that. You get sawdust on you. So we can tell through experiment that the original of this was actually worn by somebody who had Lorica Segmentata. Roman apple crumble! So here we have a chap in some rather magnificent Lorica Squamata. That's Roman scale armour. And you made this yourself, did you? That's right, there's about three and a half thousand brass scales here. And if you look at them, you can see that they are sewn together, or they're, they're wired together and then sewn onto a linen base. Right. And you have to actually lay them on quite carefully. Mm -hmm. They don't all overlap the same way, because if you do that, they tend to stand on end. So it is actually quite a complicated process. It's like tiling a roof to right. get them all in place. The other issue you have is you have three and a half thousand scales that you can choose to polish, which I did for the first ten years, but when I rebuilt it, I chose not to polish. This hasn't been cleaned other than wiping off vertigree mm -hmm. for about 17 years now, and it still looks pretty good. 17 Polished. years? Indeed. Wow. Yes, yeah, it's still got a bit of glitter to it. So if, if someone were to stab upwards against that, would, would, is there a danger that the blade would go under it? And Certainly, but cavalrymen seem to like this kind of armour. So if I were an infantryman thrusting upwards towards you, wouldn't there be a danger that my spear point goes under your scales? Yeah. That's why I'm trying to get you first with mine. Oh, that's your plan. This particular armour isn't very good for up thrust, so you have to protect yourself a bit more. On the other hand, it's nice and windproof, and it does look pretty good. So you do tend to find officers wearing it, but it's not necessarily a rule. Any kind of lorica is absolutely adequate as far as a Roman soldier is concerned. And it's just a matter of personal preference and how deep your pocket is, what you wear. Here we have a magnificently attired centurion. And so, tell me, what did you have to do to earn these magnificent uh, medals on your on your corset here? Either bravery in battle or long service, yes. All right. And uh, what does this vine stick mean here? Uh, it's a part of my badge of office, but was also used on the men for casual corporal punishment. Oh, casual corporal punishment? Did you say? Well, as opposed to a formal punishment. All right. So essentially, if you're not if you're not in line, you give them a thwack. That's right. Yes. Okay. And you've got some things that look a little bit like Celtic talks. They are called talks, yes. Right, and what do they signify? They're um, military awards. Oh, right, so what but, do you have to do to go uh, gain you those? You wear them round your neck because that would be a barbarian thing to do. Well, uh, quite right, and we're not barbarians here. I mean, for no. goodness sake, we're not wearing trousers. No, no. And uh, I see that uh, that looks like undyed horsehair in your crest. It is, yes, yes. And uh, do you think that any of it would ever have been dyed, or do you think it would just be natural uh, horse colours? We can't be taught sure, to be honest. And I see you have very, I'm going to go in for a close-up, very fine mail yes. here, yeah. which is uh, made of butted rings. I would say they're something like, what, four millimetre internal, yes, something like yes, that? that's right. So um, we, we know that they had mail that uh, fine, do we? Yes, we do, yeah. Some even finer, in fact. And did that, did that mark you out as an officer at all, no, having I very fine mail? Obviously, uh, as an officer, you would have more money to spend all your equipment. Right, and I see also that you've got your dagger on your right and your gladius, your sword, on your left. Yes. Uh, but, but the men have got it the other way round. So how correct. come this? That's, um, that's because I'm, a, I'm an officer. And every time you see sculptures of centurions, they always have their swords on the left. Right, do you think it's because they can and no one can stop them? Um, I don't know whether it's another symbol of de denoting the rank of the man, really. Right. Showing he's uh, totally different to the others. Greaves with, uh -huh. with uh, what looks like repousse work on them. Yes. And uh, again, they're, they're for, for centurions and above only, are yes, they? Yes, uh, I don't know whether they're... Um, Really to protect the legs, but to show I'm an important officer, really. Because they're, they're quite thin bronze, they're brass bronze. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not, they wouldn't give total protection to the legs. Right, but uh, at the moment you're not carrying a shield, but in battle you in, would have carried a shield, I would, would you? I would definitely carry a shield in battle, yes. Right, so you, though you wouldn't have been throwing a pilum, you'd yeah. have been uh, using the shield as your main yeah. defence. And leading from the front. Right. 
Okay, and how, how do you signal to your men? Is it, is it just shouting or do you have a, a whistle? Or a... I think you would, no, you wouldn't use a whistle. You use uh, the Latin orders to give to the men. <coughs> and if you wanted more uh, volume to your commands, then you would use um, the uh, horn player would give commands uh, with the horn. Right, so directly it's, it's yelling. Yes, that's right. Uh, and of course the vine stick. Yeah, and of course the vine stick. Okay. All right, now, artillery. So here we have a magnificent reconstruction of a Scorpionis. And uh, what, sort of, what sort of range did this have then? Uh, 380 metres. That's a very precise answer. Yeah, because that's what we've been practising at. Okay, so if I stand 381 metres away from you, am I as safe as houses? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll just uh, about get you. Oh, okay. Gonna, Aim up a bit. cranking it up to halfway. Right. So when are we going to go crank it back to here, we're going to go straight through you. My goodness, you could go 382 if you got it back there. Yeah, add a bit further. Right, so how many of these would uh, a unit have? 60 in a row. 60 per legion? Yes. And you're firing between 5 and 6 minutes. But we know there was some based um, on turrets on forts and things. Right, yes, it's small enough. With a, yeah, and, and these type as well. Mm -hmm. Now I, I see that we have what looks like modern climbing rope, modern nylon climbing rope. Safety reasons. Right, so what would they have used back in the day? Uh, what they were the, the uh, guts, um, sinews and things. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to say, tell us there was ladies' hair as well and the uh, sap of the trees. Right, so you've got, you've got sap, you've got hair, and you've got sinew yes. that are somehow mixed into some magic rope. Yes. Well, so, so where is this magic rope? Can I see some? No, you can't. Because Why not? It, the thing is, we're still in the uh, debate about it, you see, at the moment. So has anyone successfully made any magic rope? I couldn't tell you, be honest with you. Disengage ratchets! Hook the trigger onto the string! That goes in there. That's locked into place. Right. Engage ah. ratchets! Okay, and that's kept separately and I suppose doubles as a handy club in emergencies. Pull back the trigger! You put your bolt in here. Yep. Then... Twang! That's a firing mechanism. Okay. Got it. But wait, what's this big key for? It goes in there. Like that. Mm -hmm. For me. twisting the coils of rope for torsion. Tighten it up. Then yep. That's why these are in here, the holes in here. Mm -hmm. And they go in there. To get the, tap, the tightening. Straight. Right, so that entire top section rotates. And the second, and the bottom underneath as well. And all you do then is tighten it, get it to the right tensioner, put the pins in. What happened with this painted one here? Right, it came under tension, the laminate came undone, it snapped. Unfortunately, that spins round. Yeah. You have to put, here it go, hitch in the back. Right, so try not to be near any of them uh, when, they, when they snap. Yes, that's what happens. Yowch. So this degree of curvature here and where it stops, yes. you can see that the, where it stops, the, the string is pretty much straight now along yes, the back. Is, yeah. uh, so there's no point in taking it any further no. forward than that. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, if you've tried it with the, the curvature going the other way and that was a bit rubbish. Rubbish, completely rubbish. So, if I were to make some magic rope, how much magic rope would I need? About, about uh, 100 yards on both sides. So I need 200 yards? Roughly. Right, yeah, I can see that might take me all afternoon. You have to get a long road and you're walking back and forth, mm -hmm. going back and up and back and up, but it, keeping it under tension all the time. Right, I need lots of, lots of long-haired maidens and lots of cow neck tendons yes. and a lot of sap. Yes. Take a long time. <laughs> this is the Vespa or Wasp, another bolt thrower. It is tiny. There, if I get you in, in shot there, it's quite clear mm. how tiny this thing is. Yeah. So presumably it must have been a lot more powerful than an ordinary bow, otherwise they just oh, wouldn't yes. have bothered. Yeah. Yes, the powers from the these skeins of rope mm -hmm. or sinew as it would have been. Yes, we've got modern nylon rope yeah. here, but it yeah. supposedly would have been some sort of cow neck tendon rope, but yeah. I'm told that all attempts to reconstruct this have failed. Or it could have been horse hair or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. So has this particular model been uh, tried out? 
Uh, I'm not so. Yes, well, you can see the bowstring's got bits uh, frayed. Another torsion weapon was called a ballister, and that, as its name suggests, threw balls of stone. Right, just put my hand on it for scale. It is very small. This basic design of torsion weapon was also scaled up and used for massive wall smashing siege engines. So there it is in its rusted state before conservation. And they got it to look like that. Did one side of it snap off catastrophically? Now this sword was interesting because... Oh, I think I know what happened there. I think that was my attempt at a seamless segue between a video about lots of people pretending to be Romans and my trying to sell you the services of my sponsor, ExpressVPN. Uh, what, what is a, a VPN, some of you will be asking? Well, it's a virtual private network. Now, I already know that you are using the services of an internet service provider, or ISP, because, well, you're watching this video, and thank you very much for doing so, by the way. Now, at some point, excitedly, you clicked on a link uh, which sent a message to your ISP saying, I want to see this video by Lindy Page. And then the ISP sent a message to YouTube via the interweb saying, uh, we have a customer here who would quite like to see this particular video. Would you mind kindly, but thank you. And then um, the, the stream of information came back via your ISP to your screen, which is all fine and pleasant, but there are some disadvantages and there is another way of doing it. You could use a VPN. Now, why might you want to do that? Well, privacy is one reason. Um, now, all internet service providers are able to see uh, all the traffic going through them. So they're able to work out exactly uh, where you've been, all the websites you've clicked on, all those links. Um, and maybe you don't like the idea of that. For instance, uh, when I bought the sofa, you can't see this sofa, what I would call a settee, but everyone has to call them sofas for some reason these days. Uh, you can't see it, but um, I bought it. And for about six months afterwards, I was seeing really annoying and frankly pointless adverts for more settees or sofas. Um, I was possibly the least likely person in the world to buy a settee at that point, but never mind. Um, I found it annoying, and that's all it really was. It was a bit annoying, although it did tell me that my ISP is not had not really been brilliantly secretive about what websites I had been visiting because somehow the world out there knew that I'd just bought a settee or sofa. Um, and maybe you see annoying adverts like that and maybe you are a little disturbed by the fact that ISPs keep records. And in fact, in some uh, countries like Britain and Australia, they are required by regulation to keep records. What will happen with those records in the future? Well, I don't know. Uh, but if it gives you peace of mind and therefore greater happiness to think that uh, your ISP doesn't know where you've been, well, maybe you should use the services of a VPN. And what is money for if not bringing you more happiness? Uh, now. Um, if you want to see the uncensored internet, uh, you might want to be able to uh, pretend to be from another country. And uh, with uh, ExpressVPN, you can pretend to be from one of 94 countries via 2,000 servers and more. They're adding them more almost every week all around the world. So the internet will think you are in I don't know, Germany or Australia or Chad, wherever you want to be, or rather wherever you want to pretend to be from. And uh, one advantage of that, uh, for example, is that and you might be using streaming services like uh, Netflix or BritBox and maybe uh, the, you've exhausted everything you wanted to see in Netflix in your area, but if you pretend to be from somewhere else, then you get to see the menu available to people in that territory. And uh, in the case of BritBox, I think BritBox is only available in um, Australia soon. At the moment, though, Britain, Canada and America, and uh, I think that's about it. Um, and I really like the hour. Uh, sorry, a bit of a segue there, never mind. Uh, but the point is that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm enjoying something and maybe you could do if you used a VPN and pretended to be from Britain. Um, and uh, what, but then how do you get the, the ExpressVPN? Ah, well, if you go to www.expressvpn.com stroke Lindy Beige, then... That's right, if you take out a one year subscription, you can get three months for free. Right, so uh, three months free, possible offer. Click in the, in the link. I think I've pretty much said it all, really. Uh, so ExpressVPN, thank you so much for uh, sponsoring me. And now back to people pretending to be suspiciously elderly Romans. This is a Groma, a Roman piece of surveying kit. That might seem impressive enough, but near this table with its rulers, lamps, inks and Egyptian papyrus maps, you can see a nicer one in brass. The four plumb lines gave you perfectly vertical lines in two pairs at perfect right angles to each other to sight along. 
But utterly overshadowing both is this amazing device, a Dioptra surveying table. It looks like something the Victorians might have come up with, with precisely made screws and toothed gears, enabling you to get accurate measurements on uneven ground. Very handy if you want to build an aqueduct. Here's a nasty thing. Soldiers would carry perhaps just one of these for protecting the marching camp at night. So get a piece of wood when you're making a camp with loads of wood. Put a bit of a point on. Heat that up and burn it into the shaft. The reason you burn it is because you're keeping it loose. And then once they've done their ramparts, just put it on the bed, hammer that into the ground, sit that in there nice and loose, and put grasses over. Somebody sneaks up on you in the night, they tread on that. Now the reason you kept it loose, if you'd hammered that in, and they put their foot in it, reflex action, they're going to pull the foot out. It'll hurt, and they're wounded, but they can run away. If you keep it sitting loose, they tread on it, they bring it up, that's in the foot. They're not going to run away. You've got them. Let's talk about the vital topic of shoes. Shoes like this are very comfortable, but do nothing to keep your feet dry. The heel wears out the snaps there. I've only ever seen, I think, two caliber that have been dug up where that bit survives, because that joint is really hard to work out how they did it. Oh, that's a rather beautifully done shoe. And Hang on, that's not a pair of trousers, is it? Oh, no. Uh, we're all right. Uh, carry on. Of all the bath shoes that were found at Vindolanda, these are the only ones where the original upper has survived. Because normally, somebody's thrown that away and they've bodged an old piece of leather they found on to use them as the overshoes. So we don't know what the types look like, but that particular one was able to do it. But again, we're puzzled because we have this, these things here. We think, what on earth are these for? Now maybe they were fastened around the back somehow, but this doesn't look to have snapped. So they've got nice little pointed bits on them. So I do don't know. Honestly, don't know. Legionaries trained with wooden swords and shields that were double the weight of their battle equivalents. A few sticks like this won't do much, but if each man carries one and you have an army of tens of thousands, then you can quickly plant in the earth a useful barrier. A frame saw. That design hasn't changed in millennia. Some carpenter's planes there, much like modern examples. Roman equivalent of a deck chair. Yeah. Basically. Right, and so this is strictly for officers? Yes. Oh, well, yeah, I can see that. That's clearly far too advanced a chair for an ordinary trooper. Yes. Reenactment kit standards vary. These Roman costumes are rubbish. Let us now fast forward a couple of centuries to AD 400. Right, well, we have a chap here in rather magnificent late Roman kit, looking ever so Byzantine. Thank you very much. And uh, I noticed that you have some spectacular uh, brass and iron scales mixed on your cuirass there. Um, uh, did that take you all afternoon to make? Yes, managed to uh, knock it up on the way here. But uh, no, it was uh, it was actually constructed over uh, a few months, actually, by uh, by uh, the chaps over in uh, in India. Um, oh, Denial, right. Denial Steel Crafts, wonderful company, made it for me over a course of, I think it was four, maybe five months. Um, but they put it together to exact specifications, and it fits, uh -huh. fits very nicely, looks very shiny in photographs as well. So I'm a very happy bunny with this. It, it's very spangly. Do we have any good evidence for this alternating pattern? Uh, the patterns themselves, we're not fully sure exactly how they would have put them together. Um, mostly because a lot of the designs for the scales that we seem to have, or the scale armour, I should say, that we seem to have, is um, is pictographical. Mm -hmm. um, and this particular set was based off a, a sketch on a wall drawn by a soldier in Jury uh, uh, Europos. So uh, it's it's... There's no way of telling what colours he would have intended it to have been. He told me his shield was based on the diptych of Flavius Stilico. I imagine he meant this one. It is called a spiculum. So this was designed as a replacement in part for the pilum, or pilum. Um, it is a throwing weapon, predominantly. It still has the long iron shank, which uh, will bend on impact with the target. And these barbs and the pointed end will get stuck into the opponent behind, or his shield if it doesn't reach him. So that would at the very least make your shield useless if it made contact, and do some very nasty damage if you weren't fully armoured. So you think this would be thrown before contact with the enemy? Absolutely. I don't think it would be uh, particularly useful in close combat. Uh, in our period, almost every single legionary was armed with a thrusting spear as well, like the one just behind me. Um, so we we were equipped with both throwing weapons and close combat weapons to do the job. But why not just use a pilum? Um, 
For that, I can't give you a full answer. We don't know why the Pelham design fell out of, uh, of favour, um, but a lot of things did due to the, the changing nature of combat. This is a lot lighter than a Pelham. Um, you can carry a couple of them at once much more easily, um, and they don't fly anywhere um, shorter in terms of their range. So it's more of a manoeuvrability and convenience thing, perhaps, on a battlefield. Um, the Roman army at this period was a little bit more ranged heavy than it was close combat heavy. Um, we've got two, three different types of javelins to use, throwing axes, uh, throwing darts, bows, crossbows, multiple different types of artillery. Um, what dates do you have in mind? Uh, roughly here today, we're from between um, 435 to around 525 um, or so, depending on which soldier in particular you're speaking to. Uh, we try to aim for around 400 AD roughly as a, as a general benchmark but with a lot of our equipment it's very hard to give specific dates because obviously finds only reflect the time the product was actually left in the ground as a, as a, as a last resort and obviously different bits of equipment saw service in the Roman army for several generations mm -hmm. so you can never be fully sure exactly when an item was used uh, just based on when it was excavated um, so we try to stick to AD 400 as a rough guideline so in 10 years time you're about to abandon us yep pretty much so we're actually here on a final tour of duty checking whether it's worth staying but uh, no the weather's pretty terrible and uh, this beer stuff well, that'll never catch on well that's pretty <laughs> well it's even better what's inside because it holds wine uh, so it's a popular one for Roman reenactors good to see that folding chair technology survived this late so these are all goose feathers and um, we like to use waterfowl because uh, they are tough they're resilient to water um, and they easily reshape just by gently stroking them back into place. You don't have to worry about them getting too heavily damaged. Mm -hmm. um, the actual colours are not based on any particular finds because again we don't know what they would have used. Um, I, I've just gone for personal colours on it because this is the colours I tend to think go as well with the rest of my kit, blue and black. Um, what, flamingos are waterfowl? Flamingos are waterfowl and now that you've mentioned it, I think pink might be the way to go in the future. Yeah. Pink belt, pink boots, that might go. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, this helmet is uh, called the, the, the Christie's helmet. It's a very typical late Roman style ridge in the centre with uh, basically two halves of a bowl stuck together. Mm -hmm. Big cheek pieces and nasal guard. Uh, it's called the Christie's Helmet, which is uh, an unusual name because they're usually named after the place they're found, such as Budapest or Inter uh, Intercissa. Um, it's called Christie's because the original was sold at Christie's auction. Ah, that's what um, I guess. Yes. And uh, we don't is know... Is Sotheby's Helmet? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And we don't know where the original was actually uncovered, um, which has led to a couple of people saying it might be a fake. Um, ah. But I really like the shape, mm -hmm. so... <laughs> now, went for one think, of these. Do you think on campaign they would ever have been that shiny? Um, I think they would have been, partly because this is actually tinned steel, um, so it's got tinning on it, um, and also because if you don't polish your gear, it rusts, and rust equals broken kit. So uh, I do think they would have polished it as much as they possibly could with the resources they had available. Maybe not quite as shiny as this all the time, um, but to be honest, this is just a, 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 a coat of polish and uh, a lot of elbow grease. A pump drill. We like pump drills on this channel. Simple and effective. Ah, that's a very big throwing dart you've got. Well, uh, yes, you could say that. It's called a plumbata. It's a late Roman throwing dart. Now, we know that Vegetius talked about the Roman infantry carrying five of these mm -hmm. in the hollow or behind their shield. Right. And what we think is that as the shield lines were forming and the enemies coming into contact, yep. uh, the middle and rear rankers would step back on their leg pluck out one of the plumbata, throw back the arm and lob it up as high as possible. And we think what the idea was, these were short range throwing weapons, was so the Germans or the Picts or the Atticotti were coming into contact. Yep. These things would rain down ahead. So you've got this dilemma of like, you're about to advance on the Romans, you've got your shield out in front, you're about to mm -hmm. clash with the Roman front line. These things come raining down on you. Do you keep your shield down because you've got mm -hmm. the Roman spears and the front line facing you, or do you flip the, spear, uh, the shield up to right. catch these things, in which case your whole belly is uh, vulnerable to the Roman okay. attack. So short range, very vicious. You can see it's almost like a mini pilum with that long armor piercing or muscle and flesh piercing shank there with a the barbed head. Yep. It's not a killing weapon, but if it gets in you, it's gonna hurt like hell and you're going to, your instinct is to try and pull it out and it's going to rip muscle uh, and flesh aside and again that's going to incapacitate you and the Romans can move in to finish you off so 
The great thing about the plumbata is that it often breaks on impact. Mm -hmm. It's a cheap weapon to maintain because as long as you can recover this, you can burn it back into a fresh piece of wood, cut out a few bits of leather. Yep. We know we found one, or one was found with a bit of leather around it. We don't know the length of the, of the shaft, so we think they may have used leather fletchings, but the illustrations show feathers, so there's some um, kind of variation on right. that. Burn it in, dig a little hole in the ground, plop it in, put a lead, bit of lead into it, and there's your new plumbata ready to go again. So you can fire off five very quickly, they'll uh -huh. break. As long as you can salvage that on the battlefield, you can get your five back and you're on the march again. Very effective weapon. And if the enemy's got horses, uh, you're not going to kill any horses, but they're not going to want no. to stick around for very long. They won't. If you could imagine a horse, and these are raining down on the flanks or the neck, particularly unbarded horse, it's going to shy quite dramatically. And that, in that moment of shying, the rider's going to pitch, and that's when the infantry have the opportunity to open up the shields and get the spears in, pitch the rider off the saddle. So a very effective weapon. Um, like I say, not lethal, you, you're very, unless you get it in the eyeball, which is uh, you know, a painful way to go. Yeah. Try to pluck that up. Call it the Harold death, for example. Um, but very effective at uh, dis combobulating, as you might say, the enemy yep. ranks. A discombobulating, that is the actual Latin. <laughs> well, we know there were discombobulators, yeah, a particular absolutely. troop type. Yeah. Uh, very low pay, unfortunately. Discombobulate, latte, I think, is the, is the plural. Well, that's like drinking a coffee made of. No, I'm not going to go there, no. So, yes, the plumbata, the late Roman throwing dart. Right, but don't you think that uh, there's a danger if they're thrown underarm, that uh, the, the, the less coordinated or reliable and scare, uh, scared troops, they're going to be throwing them just upwards and backwards and all over the shop? Yes. My answer to that would be Vegetius talks about two Roman legions in the Balkans specialising in this weapon. And I think they were called the Joviani and the Herculiani. If they were specialists, then they knew how to wield this weapon very effectively, which means right. they were trained very well. Based on the fame of those two legions, most of the legions in the West, we think, took these weapons off because we have a lot of archaeological finds of them through the Western Empire, not so much in the East particularly. Uh -huh. But if you were trained in these and you could master the technique of releasing at the right moment, you would be equipped with them. If not, you'd be relegated to slingers or archery. We have, we know, a, a third to a quarter of Roman legionaries were trained in the bow. Uh, the sling, a very effective weapon, very vicious weapon. So there's a good chance that if you showed that you did actually do, as you're suggesting, that kind of step back, full throw, and it goes that way, yeah. it's like, oi, you, get out of the ranks, pick up that slingshot, and take that bloody arm off, you don't yeah, deserve it. backwards isn't going to harm anyone. <laughs> Except your, maybe your neck as it wraps around your, uh, uh, your but things. You, you could presumably throw these like a modern playing playing dart? Uh, well, you could. There's, there's the possibility, and we field tested these, you can get a bit of range on that. Yep. Uh, and the other way, which is more effective range-wise, if you get the spin right, you can impact a target. Mm -hmm. The only, I think, issue with this is you have to have a clear field of view to do it. So your middle ranks and your rear ranks won't be able to do it because they've got the shield wall legionaries in front. Right. So you'd risk hitting the back of their helmets. So again, this is the, the throwing up method. But if you were moving in a more skirmishing road, you were open ordered perhaps, you could advance forward, take one out, throw it, advance forward, take one out, throw it, and keep up a little mini volley to break up the enemy as they're coming towards you. Once you've used all five, then you can close up into close order. A rotary quern, a possible Roman development, although the Romans didn't invent much, just made what inventions there were more widely available. You have a, a boar satchel. Yes, that's correct, yes. Uh, it's uh, just useful for holding many things, such as... Um, my uh, wax tablets, uh, which I can oh, yeah. use to report on any soldiers who have okay, right. committed misconduct, and uh, my very handy uh, dinner knife, like so, right, uh, nice. which is actually uh, based on a Spanish hunting knife find, but it's a little bit smaller, so I can use it for eating. And this is the first authentic Roman bottle opener. <laughs> yes, yes. So Absolutely. Right. But, uh, very convincing. Very handy little thing. But the boar is right. great because the boar is uh, waterproof and durable. Um, and uh, a lot of people have leather satchels, but I prefer the animal skin because you don't have to worry too much about it uh, getting damaged in the weather um, right. or damaged by armor and shields. It's not, it's not pleasant stuff to stroke, is it though? No, it's not. It's not. It's, it's, not. it's it, it is uncomfortable. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to sleep on a boar skin. But I only usually wear this on the outside of armor or thick wool clothes, so I don't really feel it uncomfortable. On the inside, it is just uh, normal skin, so mm. the discomfort doesn't really get to me. This wicked sword was for eviscerating Saxons. Or was it? Do you even know a weapon when you see one? No, it's for weaving. Not a tapestry, an embroidery. 
Oh, what a beautiful bit of cooperage. Barrels like they used to be. No metal in this at all, not so much as a nail. Watertight when wet, but don't let it dry out or it'll leak. A rope maker. I did a whole video about that. Neither of these is a kettle, but they are both black, like all cooking vessels. A mobile field forge. You'll need a frame, a bellows, a hearth and an anvil, which needn't be huge, and then you're set up. This actually functions as a whistle as well. Time to pack away.